One thing, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I've uh, worked with the partnership for a number of years. A lot of times at these meetings we talk with some public disclosure, and I, I feel like more of my disclosure is it's working with the new diagnostics working group, I probably have less daily knowledge of diagnostics, R&D, and TB than the majority of people in this room. That's not really my day job at CDC. And what I like to think is contributing more around issues of policy and strategy. So really, what I want to talk about a little more of the story of the direction to build on what, what Daniela provided us. And to do so, we need to provide a little bit of background. Uh, some of this is looking at the background, just in general, not a detail on the new diagnostics working group. Some of but, uh, the discussions we went through in the last year, and to go into a little more detail of what Daniela mentioned about our new priorities and next steps. So, so many of you know this, but for those that are really coming into the partnership and, and hearing some of this is that this working group really was one of the earliest forums really focusing on TB diagnostics and bringing together a number of organizations around the world. That was one of the power of the partnerships. And, and some of the, really the um, accomplishments was looking at the, the diagnostics pathway um, document that came out that's you've seen this probably this diagram in a number of publications it really built a lot of the dialogue and recognition that it wasn't wasn't just a matter of doing R&D and some lab based tests and then hoping for some implementation of the diagnostic it really was a continuum and a lot of these are the you know looking at what is the um, the upstream and the downstream having to focus both on the basic research side and then a lot of the discussion of what's sometimes missing is really the, the operational research to get the countries to really put this into country policy and truly implement and accept that, and those are barriers too. Uh, at the same time, uh, when there was a lot more resources within the partnership, there were a number of subgroups, I think there's six now, at one time there were eight subgroups. There was a number of researchers that came together around childhood, TB, and other particular areas, and this was very valuable. Some were very productive with publications, uh, bringing together people and providing forums where people were not necessarily connecting on this issue. Um, but also when you look at these, these are looking at the global pan and the documents, really understanding what is the, the role of a working group on that. Um, these are very big objectives or, or goals. How do you address the existing knowledge gaps, the portfolio of new diagnostic tests, um, and, and so on, and, and looking at validation. This is really a big task when you think of the, the amount of tools that are coming out today. And the reality is we've always depended, especially in the past, on FINE to do this. This was part of their mandate. And I think they did a very good job of being very inclusive and in bringing in a number of the stakeholders. I think the good news is there's actually been an overall increase with this focus on the diagnostics, but that also complicates the world. There's a lot more organizations and stakeholders, and I think it's increasingly difficult to bring them all together so any of these activities is representative of all. And then uh, the other thing, just quickly to mention the global plan, uh, I'm not even going to go through these. These have, are essentially unchanged for the last six or seven years of looking at the point of care, drug resistance, uh, TB in children, HIV, latent TB, and progression. And we know a lot of these, in fact, most of these are really unrealized. There have been, of course, the successes with Gene Expert that has been uh, um, a big accomplishment that's really uh, doing a lot in terms of drug resistant TB, especially. And this has really just been validated or reemphasized in the most recent WHO report, focusing on the 3 million that are missed in terms of some kind of diagnosis or notification and emphasizing, once again, the need for a rapid test. This is getting to what uh, Daniel was talking about. There have been major changes. There were reductions in funding. It wasn't really a pretty picture behind the scenes. A lot of this was really uh, because of these severe reductions, and I think going to 10% of the amount of funding uh, is pretty severe. And a lot of proposals 
should we eliminate these working groups? Do we need to combine them? And so on. So it's really been a struggle. I'd have to acknowledge that really, I, I don't think we'd be able to carry on if FIND had not been really especially supporting the Secretariat and all those activities of connecting people and all of the reports. Alessandra has done a great job with that. But it's also forced us to really look and re-examine what is the core mission of a working group within the partnership. And, and these are some observations, because uh, it's not always un understood how to, and each working group is a little bit different. But in terms of research, the, the investigators, organizations, have to seek funding outside of the, the partnership. And that's not always understood. This is really coming back. It's really a convening function on that. It's not, the key role is not necessarily to do that work, and that may vary by working group, but rather really developing the strategic direction across all the partners. And there's so many organizations involved in this. And then the working groups really do have to identify gaps and propose activities and go to different donors. I worked before with GLI, and a lot of that was bringing people together, identifying, here are the priority needs, but then we would have to go to other donor mechanisms like TB Care to actually fund those, and they would be funded based on this large forum of people identifying that as one of the biggest needs. At the same time, um, the working groups do have a unique capacity in that they really do integrate the visions across a number of partners. This is really different than very often just one organization or investigator saying this needs to be done and seeking funding for that proposal. I think there's a lot more strength if people come together and identify these needs collectively. So this is, I'm not going to go over, but this is where there was a lot of change around the mission. It wasn't to do the work, but once again to really providing the strategic direction and serving for coordination and communication. So, so Danielle mentioned the first two on this of, you know, looking at what are our new goals, really looking what are the overarching research strategies and how could we do this a little bit better across the different organizations. And, and really the observation is, you know, this isn't anything new. There's actually, this has come about through many forums of researchers um, and I'm going to go over a few of those. And there have been a lot of good efforts started to really promote the visibility around coordination, especially information and data sharing. Here's just a few of these. You know, WHO went through developing the research roadmap. Uh, Marco Shito is here from NIH. Um, the CPTR um, has developed quite a bit of collaboration initially with U.S. agencies, but WHO and FIND and bringing others together. In this case, they're sponsoring a diagnostics forum. They do have a focus on drug susceptibility testing with an emphasis um, of having this available for new regimens. But this is a really good example. Um, the treatment action group has really been effective, I think, in helping with information to identify the amount of funding that's coming in from all the different organizations for research, not only for diagnostics, but drugs and vaccines being able to measure these trends and to, to be an advocate for that. And there's a group here today, I think, meeting afterwards. The, the UK is also starting one of their own projects um, called the 100,000 Genomes Project, and there's a focus on TB. And, and I apologize, there may be, I think, a number of others that are all coming to some of the same conclusions. We need to coordinate better. We need to share information. We have to have some of the shared systems on this. Um, I would make the observation on this, and I think all are realizing some of these are doing this in parallel, and we could probably be more powerful if we connected these efforts. And another thing I don't want to forget to say is some of these I would also observe uh, is sort of divided by the Atlantic Ocean. A lot of these are North American or U.S. government sponsored. Others are EU, and there's a lot more to do to bring those together so it's not two parallel structures all looking at greater coordination and shared data. This is just, um, this is the graph from TAG on this. This is looking at the diagnostics funding on this. This is 42 million. Within the global plan, this is really identified as a funding gap of about 300 million. And there's two things to look at. Certainly there is that gap 
there really needs to be more on this. But there's also that focus and a lot of discussion, could we do better with the 42 million or whatever the current investment is? Could we leverage that and be a little more efficient and effective and reduce duplication across the different organizations sponsoring this? And I would also say this doesn't even represent a lot of the other isolated researchers that are not seeking funding from these big organizations or governments and it doesn't even include a lot of the, the company investments in the process. So, uh, Ruth McNearney could not be with us today. I like this quote. And it, it's realizing there is some barriers, something we have to explore because this gets into the area of um, intellectual property. And that's not just companies, it's really, it's organizations, it's universities. It's even agencies and others. Everyone has to really seek and, and fight for their funding these days. And a lot of that can be based on their capability to do research. And I think the most important thing is we just have to accept that, that we, we all have these agendas and have to work at this. So some of the challenges is where should competition begin and end? And recognizing that overall, I think most of the donors want to accomplish the goal of diagnostics. This is certainly true for governments that do expect that the organizations would collaborate if it increases the chances of accomplishing the goal. And I would give an example of um, even with the U.S. government um, and especially accelerated by the Obama administration, looking at open access to data, recognizing that we're public servants, national agencies, we collect a lot of data, and this should not be treated as intellectual property. And this really should be much more open access for that. that. That's easier said than done. A lot of this will probably be more prospective than retrospective. And that applies not only to data, but even looking at collections. There are lots of discussions of how moving forward agencies have to make their collections much more accessible to outside organizations. So I think it's true that the intent is there of having access. So the last couple slides, the stakeholder forum uh, one is that Daniela talked about this, that there already is work for one focused on the drug susceptibility testing and drug resistance, because that is really seen as an urgent need. There's a lot of work in place and a need to connect people as soon as possible. We also think there's this need to look at the broader question, looking at the topic today, the point of care tests, biomarkers, and so on, and look at the broader questions of data sharing among organizations. These are some of the expected outcomes, and this is not, you know, uh, an ex you know, an inclusive list. I think there's others. Most importantly, it will be a lot of the stakeholders that understand this, that know what is really feasible um, and can be supported. But it's looking at the transparency and data sharing. Um, one, looking at specimen banks, making sure those are supported and accessible for companies, and maintaining that support. Data banks for sequences, and I include the last one, I think I saw Tony Canadzera there, also looking at, at standards, some communications looking at, if we want to share sequence data, especially drug resistance, we really have to have standards of relating that to information such as the drug susceptibility testing patterns. If we don't, it's not really very useful. Hopefully that'll come up in, in discussions later. The last, the last comment on this is that this actually came up quite a bit in the WHO symposium yesterday. Quite a number of groups recognize that we do great things, but there's a lot of need for coordination and data sharing across TB you know, research and development. So it was a general thing. This came from a number of speakers, but one thing I would like to, one thing that struck me was one of the comments, we need to be more efficient and effective in developing data sharing systems. At the same time, we still need, even if we did that all, we still need more resources. So it's really both. It's not one or the other. I would like to think they're linked, and maybe the question is, we always like to think that the statistics of TB are so compelling that we will get more funding. But maybe it's also if we showed that we were much more efficient and that it was a better investment because of the data sharing across the globe, maybe that others would see this is a really good investment. So I think they're linked, and I'd end by just acknowledging this is really representing the discussions of all of the core group. So thank you on that. And I think we're going to more questions. Thank you.